Hey there, friends and running fans. This is Ambi Burfoot bringing you the latest episode of the podcast, Running State of the Sport. My co-host, George Hirsch, was not able to join us this week, so I'm going it alone. But I'm lucky enough to have the great good fortune to chat with top American marathon runner Jessica McLean. Jess finished fourth at last February's Olympic marathon trials in Florida, and then fourth again in the Olympic track trials 10,000 in June. Some might consider her the tough luck kid of 2024, but that's not the way Jess sees herself. Not at all. Jess also found herself in another interesting situation in August. Less than a week before the Olympic marathon, she was summoned to Paris as a possible alternate for another U.S. runner. She didn't know who that runner was, or if she, Jess, would actually be on the start line on race day, Sunday, August 11th. As it turned out, she wasn't. Today, Jess will give us all of the details behind her strange and unusual trip to Paris. In a couple of weeks, Jess will be headed to her next big race. That's at the New York City Marathon on November 3rd. Before talking with Jess, I gotta say a few words about Sunday's Chicago Marathon. First, I want to give Chicago organizers credit for granting one-year entry extensions to any Florida runners who couldn't make it to Chicago due to the state's double blast from hurricanes. That was the right thing for Chicago to do, and it's always nice when a big organization does the right thing. Second, Ruth Chepengedich? Wow. She not only broke the previous women's world record, 2.11.53, but she broke the 2.10 barrier as well, with her winning time in Chicago of 2.09.56. We never actually imagined we'd hear those numbers coming along with a woman's marathon time. It seems so far off just a couple of years ago, but now it has been broken, and we're just left shaking our heads in near disbelief. Even crazier, Chep and Gedditch started the race at sub-207 pace and passed halfway at 208 pace. Incredible running. There will be skeptics, and I understand why. But we shouldn't go there just now, I don't think. Other runners posted great results in Chicago also. In fact, winner John Career topped an impressive year. He won Falmouth by 50 seconds in August by running the second half at Chicago in 60.25 and breaking the tape in 202.44. That's merely the second fastest time ever in Chicago. And you know about the fastest. That was last year when Kelvin Kiptum set a world record with his 200.35. The American women didn't run quite as well as they hoped as Kira D'Amato dropped out and Sarah Hall and Betsy Sena finished in 2.30 and 2.31, respectively. The top American woman was Susanna Sullivan. She ran a 2.26.56, excuse me, PR. A great accomplishment for her. And the top American man was the ever-reliable C.J. Albertson, who also set a PR with his 2.08.17. And that's it for the biggest news, and it was really big news, from the Chicago Marathon. Now let's turn to Jessica McLean, this week's guest at running State of the Sport. Jess Jess finished fourth at both the Olympic Marathon trials last February and the track trials later in the year in Eugene. Despite flying under the radar screen, for the most part in recent years, In September, she ran strong enough to win the USATF 10K road title on Long Island, and she's got a big one coming up next. That's the TCS New York City Marathon on November 3rd. Jess, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm I'm very excited to be here. You've had some amazing guests that I've listened to um, on some runs and during work the last few weeks, so I'm glad to be here, and I understand that we have a um, a friend in common, Jeff Messer. So, uh, got to give him a shout out as well. <laughs> uh, absolutely. You know, the funny thing is, you know, uh, Jeff better than I do, but he was, uh, 
an alumnus from Wesleyan University where me and Bill Rogers and Jeff Galloway and a few other people graduated in the good old days. And I've heard nothing but wonderful things about his coaching from many, many people. So maybe he'll come up. But but first, uh, let's get a little brief bio background from you for the listeners. How old are you? Where are you living? What's your family situation? And uh, what do you do when the alarm goes off early in the morning and the rest of the day? <laughs> <laughs> Great uh, way to start. My So yeah, I am 32 years old. I actually started running when I was around 12. So I've been running for almost 20 years now, which is very cool. Um, I live in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, did a stint um, away for college at Stanford for five years, 2010 to 2015, and then ran professionally for Brooks in Seattle from 2015 to 2018. But I'm ultimately back here in the desert as of 2019. And I love it. I've got my whole family here. I met my husband in 2019, just before the pandemic, um, which was, you know, good timing, I guess. <laughs> Thank you, universe. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we live in Phoenix, have a dog. Um, he was a COVID dog. We got him the day Phoenix shut down and he's my little work buddy. But um, yeah, the alarm clock this time of year goes off around 445. Mm. Um, if it's, I know if it's a good day, sometimes 5 a.m. Um, it's been really hot this summer in Phoenix. We're almost, we almost have the three, you know, triple digit degree weather in the rear view mirror, but um, we get up early. My husband's in construction. So we're up early. I get my run in. Um, usually wrap up with that around 7.30, get home, walk the dog. Depending on whether or not I'm working from home or out in the community, I'm showering up right away, getting a good breakfast in, and then, um, yeah, hitting the computer, hitting the emails, or I'm out uh, working for either of the nonprofits that I work for. Um, and then, yeah, depending on the day, I'm either back in the gym or on a second run, but then uh, we always cook a dinner. Um, head to bed early, and that's kind of the day in the life <laughs> for the most part. Well, that's more than a full day, and we're going to talk a little bit about everything you just mentioned. I was surprised when I heard you say the second workout because uh, I was under the impression that you were a one workout a day gal, but that'll be interesting to discuss when we get there. <laughs> I mostly am. I If I'm in the gym, it's, you know, I'm I'm using the uh, stair stepper or jogging for a minute or two just to warm up for, you know, some sort of strength workout. Um, I actually implemented double runs two weeks ago for the first time in years. So I'm mostly a strictly one and doneer for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so you were very much in the news in August for a situation not of your own making and, and perhaps it's a sensitive situation. But as the alternate uh, on the uh, Women's Olympic Marathon team, that usually doesn't mean much. I'm not sure it's ever meant anything, but you actually got a call and somebody said, get on a plane, come on over to Paris. We've got a situation. Could you tell us uh, how that unfolded for you personally? And then we'll go on to the next stage of the question. Yeah, I uh, am anticipating questions about this whole experience. Um, you know, it happened on a big stage and totally fair that folks are interested to hear a little bit more. But the funny thing is, is like there's not there's not a ton of detail <laughs> to really share other than, yes, I got a call the Monday before the Women's Olympic Marathon, which fell on that Sunday, August 11th. Um, and it was proposed to me as a, an ultimate choice of my own, whether I would get on the plane or not, knowing that my chances of running were likely 50% or, or less. Um, and I, you know, had trained with the impression that I wouldn't get the call, but I would train for the marathon and just tap into that system throughout my track season as if I might. So, I, um, you know, got the call and I booked my ticket um, for the next day. There's a direct out of Phoenix as of like this year to France, <laughs> um, luckily. So I, I got out of Dodge on a Tuesday, landed on Wednesday in Paris, ran the course. Um, there was a really hilly nine mile portion of the course and I ran that as soon as I landed. Um, 
just to set myself self up as well as I could for that um, more interesting portion of the course that we all have heard so much about. Of course. Uh, but yeah, I, I didn't know anything about the athlete. I actually had no idea. I committed to getting on the plane before I even knew which event it was for. I, I had to send a, had to send a follow-up text to ask if that, it was that for That didn't the... occur to me at all. <laughs> I know. Me either, actually. I Yes, I shot a follow-up text pretty much just as I was booking my flight um, to see if I should be packing spikes or my road racing <laughs> shoes. But um, yeah, I think a lot of who I have become this year is just stepping up to challenges and not being as fearful as I may have been as the athlete I was maybe, you know, eight or 10 years ago. Um, so yeah, I, I just got on the plane. Um, ultimately the first feeling I felt was, you know, holy crap. And then the second one was just the, just sinking gut for the person that's going through, you know, this decision at all. I I had no idea who it was or what the circumstances were. Um, And I, you know, I, I'm not quite sure what the protocol is from USATF's perspective or the athlete's perspective. All I could do was control the controllables in my own court. And and that was getting on the plane and um, being there in case I was needed. Um, But yes, as I got to Paris, the chances that I would run were less and less likely Um, And I knew that would be the case or could potentially be the case. So I was just trying to make the most out of the experience. And it would have been my first time really racing competitively abroad. I think I had like one NACAC experience in my life, but um, I was just trying to really soak that all up and learn as much as I could from being there. Yeah, well, you certainly did the right thing by getting on the plane and going over there and making yourself prepared for whatever eventuality beyond your control, far beyond, as you said. Uh, We all know now, and we knew on Sunday morning in Paris pretty quickly that Fiona O'Keefe had developed something quite debilitating, and she hoped that a few days of rest would clear her up and she'd be able to go the distance. Of course, that didn't happen. When did you find out who the athlete was and what the situation was and when was the last day you could have been subbed in and what were you doing while you weren't watch, running the marathon? <laughs> um, yeah, so the deadline was Friday evening. I can't remember exactly what time that was. Um, and yeah, so essentially, you know, Wednesday I landed there and I had a few days of really laying low trying to respect whoever it was that was in that position. You know, I I ran the course and I ran into people out there, um, which I tried to, I really tried to avoid running into anybody um, just so there wouldn't be this buzz created. Um, But I I had to run that portion of the course just in case. I I think if I hadn't and I ended up racing, it definitely would have been a shock to the system. And um, it actually gave me a lot of confidence running that portion of the course. I felt I mean, granted, it was a nine mile run versus, you know, you're (laughs) well into a marathon having to take on those hills. But um, I actually would have loved to race on that course. I think it was amazing. And it was, you know, playing field leveler um, in some respects. But but yeah, I I found out Friday I was really laying low. I was uh, emergency tapering because I, I did, you know, hit the training quite hard the week prior. Um, so I was really just trying to rest up and get the travel out of my legs and eat as much pasta as I could to get these glycogen <laughs> stores, you know, working for my, uh, working on my, on my end. But, um, yeah, after that, I luckily had some family out there. So we just made the most of being in Paris and tried to spectate the marathon, but didn't really quite understand how, um, you know, high security would be in certain points and how tough it would be to get around. So we ultimately just saw the finish. Um, We ran into a few Aussies who were actually like live streaming the race outside of the finish stadium. So we, it was really fun. There was a group of us actually watching live just outside and being able to hear the the roars of the the spectators. Um, But, you know, I, from the get go, it was never my decision to make other than to get on the plane. Um, the rules are the rules and it was entirely Fiona's call. Um, so I have nothing but 
respect for, you know, the process she, and I don't even know exactly what she went through. And that's the hardest thing. It's like, I, I can't speak for them and I can't speak for USATF. All I can do is speak for myself, but um, I just hope she's recovering and gearing up for another great year and whatever's next for her. Um, She's so young and has such a long road ahead of her. And I have come to, um, I don't know, I've gained a lot of perspective over the last four years or so. And what was really ultimately the lesson I learned being there for myself was that I would love to compete on the Olympic stage and the mm-hmm. world stage, but it inevitably, like it, it wouldn't define my career if I didn't. Um, I think there are so many amazing opportunities now being a road racer, the majors, um, there are so many races that, um, I would love to be in the mix for, including the TCS in the New York marathon coming up. So I, I gained a lot of perspective, learned a lot about myself that I, I could, get on the plane and game up, um, and have a really good attitude about it. Um, so I, I walked away proud of how I handled the situation and it ultimately made me really excited for New York in 2028. So, um, that, that was really cool to have that perspective coming back home. So certainly Fiona had a terrible situation to have run great in the trials win look ready for something strong in Paris and then injuries happen to everybody and to Mm -hmm. have one happen at the last moment as she did, it must've been an excruciating decision for her. Mm -hmm. You could only wait. Um, So it's uh, you're implying that you and she haven't talked since that situation and maybe you will say TF either. No, um, we exchanged if, you know, brief messages. I just wanted her to do what was best for her in terms of recovery. And I was not going to be somebody to add any additional stress um, or anything to the situation. And I've communicated with USATF that I would love to have a more at length debrief um, about my experience and maybe what could have gone better. Uh, And I probably won't share much about that until I have that conversation, if at all. Um, But yeah, I mean, as the alternate, you're not really owed anything. I, I do wish maybe, you know, for stronger communication um, or just expectations, I think, um, because a lot of that I was learning on the fly as I was, you know, flying there and had no Wi-Fi and trying to figure life out. Um, but it's all good. It's, you know, it's it's I have no hard feelings and um, whatever I can do to maybe make that process better for a future alternate, I like sign me up, but it's a tough situation. Like it's, it's entirely up to the athlete, um, who has made the team and there's not much outside of that, that an alternate can, can do other than to just be ready in case something, you know, you're needed or something happens. Well, Jess, thank you so much for your, your full disclosure on all of this. I didn't mean to drag you over the calls and certainly there was nothing you could have done differently than what you did. You were kind of an innocent bystander, but I'm so glad that you have talked to the officials at USATF and said, let's do a debrief and maybe see if we can help make the situation a little better for the next person who gets put through the ringer like I did. And and Fiona too, it was tough on both of you. Let's let it go and move on to (laughs) the easy stuff. So, um, I'm going to call you a high school sensation because in high school, you won a lot of state titles and you went to the Foot Locker Cross Country Nationals four years in a row, which can't be true of more than a very small number of people. How how did you begin running at age 12, you said, and how did you get so good so fast? <laughs> oh my gosh, it's crazy to think back that far. I... From a young age, I I started in soccer, which is, you know, a classic tale. I played midfield. So that essentially means you're just running up and down the field for the entirety of the game. Um, And I loved I loved that. And then I, you know, there were glimmers of of some talent there in the P.E. mile. As a young kid, I'd beat all the boys in P.E. and um, would love that. And then (laughs) I had a, a P.E. coach who suggested I go out for the after school track program since I, I loved it so much and I did. And I think, um, that was kind of when the competitive 
the love for the competitive nature of the sport really uh, started for me. Um, and it's it's been that way pretty much ever since. I There's a few races uh, at the high school level in Arizona where we would line up with the boys. We would start in cross country all on the line together. And I loved that. And even to this day, when I get into a race with, you know, we start men and women on the same line. Um, I have so much fun lining up with the men. Um, but high school was interesting. I, uh, I worked with Jeff Messer, who we've talked about and brought up. Um, I actually started with him in middle school. So he, a funny story is I, you know, my mom was conversing with him about when we would meet for the first practice uh, together. And he said, let's do five. And she's like, oh, okay, that's great. You know, five is you know, enough time after school. We'll, we'll be there. And he's like, oh no, I meant 5am. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and this was like as a 13 year old or something. And I was, oh boy. I mean, that was a wake up call, but I think that instilled in me a lot of, um, discipline and, uh, just work ethic. I think when you have somebody like Jeff who, believes in you, but he's going to put in exactly what you put in and you, you have to match each other. And it's a, it's a true partnership, which I have loved ever since we started working together. Um, so we, you know, started working together and then I, I got to high school and he actually ended up, um, we both got to, to Xavier college prep together. He was a coach there alongside Dave Van Sickle, who just retired after 30 plus years, mm. which is crazy. Um, and then, yeah, I just had a pretty quick start to my career in high school. I think I got a few freshman records and, um, I won state, I think as a freshman, I can't remember if it was cross or in track, I should know this. Um, but yeah, and ultimately ended up qualifying for Foot Locker nationals four years in a row, which I did not know was a big deal until I did it <laughs> as a senior, <laughs> Um, but I just remember high school being a very awesome balance of, you know, that pursuit of excellence from a younger age as a high schooler mixed with a lot of fun. Like a lot, a lot of what stands out to me aren't the state titles. Yes, those were great, but it was a lot of the in-between moments, you know, in the locker room with my teammates on the bus, on the way to the cross country meets, we won state one year and Dave Van Sickle said we could graffiti his car if we won. <laughs> So we ended up just tagging his van and he had to drive around in it for, he was going to get a new car anyways, but um, all those moments just made it so fun. And I think that helps with the longevity of careers. And I, I hope that high schoolers are having fun right now. I know there's just so much added pressure out there with social media and NIL and so many new things going on. And I, I think for me, a lot of the, a testament, obviously to my coaches for, um, coaching me to have such a long career, but also keeping it fun enough that I stayed in it. Um, and then my parents were awesome and didn't, you know, they weren't these helicopter parents that forced me to do anything. Um, I was very lucky to stumble upon running early and they did everything they could to support me and keep it fun as well. So it was a lot of good people in my, my court. <laughs> And, and you you mentioned excellence in the middle of that uh, response. I'm going to just take a flyer here. I bet you were a straight A student, weren't you? I was. Yes. Yeah, you disgusting people. <laughs> Not until yes, I, Stanford changed that for me though. I was happy with some C's there for sure. But high school, yeah, I was I was a full blown nerd, and I loved it. Um, I think I got a few B's here and there, but. No, I, yeah, I, that was something completely internally inflicted pressure that I put on myself was to be a straight A student as much as I could be. Um, well, it's a but characteristic yes. <laughs> of a lot of the top young runners, I think. And, and, and it's a terrific thing as long as they're able to keep it from being too pressured and too stressed, of course. So Stanford, um, it looks like you had a good career there, but you didn't, blow anything wide open and win national championships every season or anything like that? How, how, how would you characterize your running at Stanford? Yeah, I think that's a very fair statement. I think I was consistently in the mix, um, you know, on the cross country course and track. I did win a few uh, Pac-12 titles in the 10K towards the latter half of my career. And I did have, I believe a top time in the 10 K as a collegiate one of those years as well. So there were sparks of, of, you know, that, um, top ranked, I guess you would say 
uh, element. But yeah, it's funny. I look back and I'm like, man, I I definitely wish I could have I could put the brain I have now into the body that I was then and just you know, have a body that was 18 to 22 years young with the knowledge that I have now and the perspective. I think there were a few times on the bigger stages where I I let the pressure get to me quite a bit. Um, But ultimately, I think my Stanford career was awesome. I had three different coaches while I was Mm -hmm. there. So I think I learned a lot about adaptability, being able to work with different people, Um, learned a lot about leadership and how to be a good teammate and balance life and academics and a bunch of other things. So I loved my, and I have some of the best friends in the entire world from Stanford. So I I had an awesome time there. And uh, a lot of the same memories that I had in high school were those in-between moments with the team and my friends. So so yeah, nothing but good things to say about the farm. (laughs) Whenever I'm in Palo Alto and see Stanford, the first thing that comes to my mind is, do the kids who go to Stanford University realize how lucky they are to be like on this incredible heavenly spot on earth? Oh, I think that's the hard part. And the sad part is we don't, you don't know what you, you've you got till you're not there anymore. And I think, um, I wish I pinched myself a little bit more while I was there, you know, biking down Palm Lane and around campus and working out at the track with, you know, just that backdrop <laughs> every day. Um, And I think Stanford's a a very interesting, like, pressure cooker situation. Um, I think they call it, what is it, the floating duck syndrome, where everybody looks really cool and calm and collected (laughs) on the surface, but then under the water, (laughs) their legs are just paddling to stay afloat. Um, A lot of overnight successes, you know, have started and come from Palo Alto and Silicon Valley. And I think a lot of students and athletes there just expect that to happen to them overnight. And you have to really enjoy and make the most of your time, like in the process and the journey. And I think I really learned that my, my last two years there with coach Milt, who um, instills that approach, I think in a lot of his athletes, very process and journey oriented, but gosh, I do wish I just realized what I had while I was there. It's such an amazing place. Well, maybe it comes back and infuses and and gives you insight in in the later years as well. You know, you've had so many interesting experiences and we're barely scratching the surface. There's a lot to go. I I am going to pick it up a little just to save on (laughs) your time. After Stanford, you, you did move from your lovely desert there in Phoenix out to Seattle and mm-hmm. I gather that wasn't the best experiment of your life. How would you characterize it? Yeah, it's it's funny. I always thought I, I would look back on that and be like, man, I wish I did something else or made a different decision, but I never think that. I think I learned so much. Um, and I've learned a lot more from the, the times that were tough and when things didn't go right than the times that were, you know, smooth sailing. Um, but yeah, my time at Brooks initially was... I mean, it was great. I had, you know, a lot of good memories and great teammates and friends that came out of that. But ultimately, I think it was a lot of things I maybe didn't need at that point in my career. I think I I threw myself into something I honestly don't think I could I could handle. Um, but what I didn't know how that? to just a lot of you know changes environmentally. Seattle was so different, super gloomy. I think I was really seasonally depressed and didn't know it. I think, um, you know, we had a huge emphasis on nutrition that was different than anything ever before. And I wasn't used to really keeping tabs on that. And we were implementing really hard lift sessions, which was completely new to me. I was trying to keep up with some of the best women in the country in the 5k and the 1500, you know, who were, I mean, top 10 in the world, I think at the time and going for the podiums at, at the trials and U S championships. And I just don't think, um, I was quite ready for that, but I, I think a lot of it too, was I didn't know how to communicate that I wasn't ready for that. And I didn't know how to advocate for what I think I needed at the time. Um, but what ended up happening was just, a a multi-year cycle of injury. Um, I think I would get injured pretty much every six months. Um, Mm. it'd be anything I I've had it all. I had 
calcaneal, you know, a plantar fasciitis tear at my calcaneal attachment with bone spurs. I've had a complete metatarsal fracture. I've had multiple tibia, fibula stress reactions and fractures. I've, yeah, I've had it all pretty much from the hips down. So <laughs> um, at some point I just had to wake up and, and realize like, Hey, I'm doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And I, mm -hmm. I just need to do what's best for me. And that decision was really tough, but I ultimately decided to move back to Phoenix, um, at the end of 2018, start of 2019. And I actually synced back up with Jeff and he was coaching me and everything was going great. We were aiming for the 10 K for the 2020 Olympics, going to debut in the half marathon in New York in March of 2020. And then yes, the pandemic hits and, um, completely knocked the wind out of my sails. I think I lost all motivation to compete, which hadn't really happened before. Uh, and I had other things going on in my life. I had met my now husband and was around family again and have reconnected with friends and got my first full-time marketing job. So I was just excited about everything else besides running for the first time in my life and decided through the pandemic to just really pour myself into all of those things. Um, I, I, run, I pretty much ran every day, very minimally, but um, yeah, I didn't compete basically from, you know, mid 2019 all the way through Graham, or, uh, Mason Marathon in 2022. So I, yeah, I was off the, uh, out of the scene for a little bit until I rebranded myself and got married. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's interesting. I was going to ask you, ask you this a little later, but it seems appropriate now. Uh, you're far from the only runner. A lot of them are females who, who somehow had years off from the sport. Of course, childbirth in some cases and marriage mm -hmm. and COVID in your case. And uh, some of them are way two or three years. Some of them eight or nine years. And yet they get it together and they come back. And a lot of these people are, are, are running at a fantastic level now. What is it mm -hmm. about taking a little time off and putting some perspective into your running that makes a difference? Such a good question. And it's been so interesting to hear other stories that are similar, like Kira and uh, yes. many others. But I think, well, it's exactly what you said. It's perspective. I think I took time away and I realized, okay, on this giant planet, running is a very, very small part of it, but it seems so big when it's all that you've known. I mean, I, I've been good at the sport since I was 12 and it has just been entirely wrapped up in my identity. And I think once I was able to disassociate from it a little bit, I started to realize like, okay, I'm, I'm much more than the runner, the Stanford runner, the runner for Brooks, the, you know, um, and I started to notice like, Hey, my friends and family and everybody, they love me because I'm Jess. And it's not just because I'm this elite runner. And I, I just gained a lot of perspective and I actually ended up falling back in love with running when I had a lot of the same feelings about it when I did when I was younger. And maybe it was because I, you know, came back to Phoenix and I was running on the same canals and bike paths mm -hmm. and streets that I was when I was, you know, a teenager. But um, yeah, I just, I found the same love that I had for it um, when I first got into it. And then I think I knew that competitive nature was still in there and I wanted to run a marathon before I turned 30. It just sounded like a fun thing to do, which is kind of <laughs> psychotic. <it> <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so I signed up for a local marathon after our honeymoon. We got married in November of 2021, got back from Hawaii, like right before Thanksgiving. And I started training like after Christmas. Um, so it was a really short buildup. It was like a six week buildup. I had no idea what I was doing barely fueled for the race, did everything wrong. And I ended up running like 2.33. Um, and I, I was like, oh my God, I think I could, I think I could qualify for the trials if I want to do it. And uh, just kind of like the flame got reignited. So that was kind of the start of chapter, whatever this is in my running career. <laughs> chapter one is Jess yeah. McLean. So <laughs> good. And then the next year you went to grandma's and ran a 229 and change. And that I did said something. And yet as the trials were coming up in early this year, 
Uh, nobody had Jess McLean in their picks for top three or top five. I'm not sure you were in the top 10, Jess, but that's okay. <laughs> that is you okay. Ran, you ran your race. How did you get yourself in shape for that race in February? And and how did you uh, evaluate your chances and the way you should go after that competition? That's a great question. I... Oh man, I think I, well, first of all, I have amazing friends and training partners here in Phoenix that I have synced up with and met over the last few years and they're all marathoners. So they have done this many times over. So I just kind of like put myself in the fold and it just ended up being what they were doing and I just ended up enjoying it. Um, and I leaned on them quite a bit for Intel and I do coach myself now, um, with a little help from my friends. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but, uh, yeah, my approach was just stay healthy. I, I was supposed to run the marathon championships in December of, oh gosh, it was a CIM set 2022. I got a sacral stress fracture two weeks before mm-hmm. it because I, I was doing, I went from one extreme of the Mesa marathon of not doing enough, not knowing what I was doing to then doing way too much. Um, high mileage, high inten- two high intensity workouts a week, one quality long run. I was working full time at a, you know, like <laughs> desk office gig. That's um, like a requirement. So- Everybody's got to go from one extreme to the other, right? <laughs> yeah. So I learned my lesson the hard way, uh, in 2022. And I'm like, I am never going to let myself get to a starting line, not healthy again. That's like going to be my MO until I am done doing this. So I dialed it back. I just did one really quality session a week and then one really quality long run, never exceeded 72 miles going into the trials. Um, But I just had so much fun. It's like the most fun I've had for a build. And I feel the same right now training for New York that I did for Orlando. So I feel like I'm doing things right. Um, But my, my teammates were just like, Oh, I think I think you gotta put yourself in this a little more than you're planning because you're looking fit, you're looking good. And they have come from, you know, groups like NAZ and Rosie ran for um the UK and is run with a lot of those amazing marathoners. Um, so I just kind of trusted them and I stayed quiet and I put my head down and I just wanted to get to Orlando healthy. And then in my mind, I initially had a top 10 goal. And then watching people just cook themselves. Like, I just was like, oh my gosh, people are running in saunas on treadmills and <laughs> running in. Like, I, I just felt confident of being from Phoenix. And I know what it feels like when the heat makes you want to, like, give up. <laughs> mm. um, I've been there. I've had to go into dark places a lot living here in the last few years. Um, so that gave me a lot of confidence and just how I felt. I felt really fresh and I felt like my legs were, had a lot of life in them. Um, so I, and then once people started coming back to me at the halfway mark, I just, I'm like, don't lose momentum. Like take each person that you catch as like a slingshot forward and just keep moving. Um, and that's kind of what I did. So I've got a question which comes from my own experience. Many centuries ago, I ran an Olympic marathon trials where at the 10-mile mark, I could visualize myself finishing third. Frank Shorter and Bill Rogers were in the race. Nobody was going to beat them. But after that, it was up for grabs. I didn't come close to third. I faded. I finished 10th. But I had that moment of seeing something brilliant. Did you ever in that race see yourself sneaking into third? I, I, I had a weird feeling that I'd be in the mix or very close to the Olympic team, which is so weird because I have never been able to picture myself making a team. And I think that was a a big part of my problems at mental blocks is feeling like I didn't belong pretty much the entirety of my career. And this is the first time where I'm like, I, I can see myself maybe doing this. Um, and I don't know why, like I, I'd been out of it for so long, but I think I just, noticed um that I especially once I got to the hotel I'm like oh my gosh the amount of people just from the outside that look like they aren't enjoying this is so Mm. and that I've been there like I've been there where every race is just like oh it's just like the the weight on your shoulders and you're so nervous and 
Um, I felt like I had nothing to lose. I didn't have a contract. I have my own job. I make my own money. I support myself. Like that's not a stress anymore with, you know, at that time, the contract thing wasn't a stress to me. Um, I didn't even think about what would happen if the race went well, or if it didn't, I just got there and I was excited and, um, really felt like I had nothing to lose. So that was pretty cool. <laughs> and in the race though, I mean, you were picking people off. Did, did you ever see third place Dakota? And did you ever think, wow, maybe the last mile I could kick in and catch third? <laughs> I didn't think that until I had about, I actually didn't know I was in fourth until Uh, about less than a mile to go. There's just so much happening in front of you when you're, you aren't in the mix from the start. Um, I didn't know certain people had dropped out. I didn't know certain people had stayed up there the whole time or were in the mix from the beginning. Um, so I, man, yeah, you know, there's a lot of coulda, woulda, shouldas, but, um, yeah, I think I'm the only one that wishes a marathon was longer in that <laughs> circumstance. <laughs> but no, nope, I think it all shook out how it was meant to shake out. So, so some think people think you're the tough luck kid of 2024 because you were fourth in the marathon, fourth in the <laughs> track trials. How, how do you feel about your tough luck this year? Oh, man, I don't think it's tough luck at all. I think... Uh, I'm stoked with how this year's gone. I feel like I'm just tapping into the potential that I have at this level. And I think I was meant to get forth to show myself that I do want it. Um, Mm. In the 10K, I was like, if this race doesn't go out, I'm battling for fourth because I know the top three big guns are going to just dust me in the last mile. If this is a jog fest, the first few miles, <laughs> I was hoping it was going to go out quick and I, I may have a chance at that point, but I knew pretty much halfway through the race, like, Oh man, okay, we're going to battle for fourth again. Um, but I no, I, I squeezed the most out of myself on each of those days and I ran my, my race and Um, the more I can keep doing that and trusting my own intuition, the better, like I go into these races and I don't, everybody's like, what's the race plan? What's the goal? And I literally really don't have a race plan. Like I just want to be adaptable and reactive and responsive in the race and, um, pay attention to people around me and the cues that I'm seeing. And I feel like that's such a fun way to race now, instead of being married to a race going one way or another, um, it, at least it's working for me. So that's kind of, I'm just going to try and stick to my guns and trust my gut. <laughs> well, ultimately it's the smartest way to race. It's not easy because some people just get, need to get locked into something mentally, uh, but it's got to be the best way in a, in a world, especially in the marathon where things change every weekend with the weather and the competition and the course and the hills, mm-hmm. uh, et cetera. Before we move to the end of this uh, interview and talk about New York City, I do want to give you a chance to talk about your work. It it appears you've been at one foundation primarily for a few years now. Could you tell us about that foundation, what it does, and what you do there? Yeah, so I am... I work for two nonprofits um, who have the same owners. And so I'm the executive director of the Love Up Foundation, which um, really focuses on foster youth advocacy in Arizona um, statewide. We work very closely with the Department of Child Safety and other organizations to really um, just bring a lot of, you know, well, first of all, to give foster youth visibility in Arizona, but then also to give them experiences and events that they otherwise would not be able to um, partake in. And then, which has been very amazing. And my my mom was actually, um, she was a court appointed social advocate for kids in between the foster system and the courts, the court system growing up. So I've been exposed to that world quite a bit. Um, and it's just very fulfilling. And then I'm also the marketing director for their Love Pup Foundation, which <laughs> is um, a dog rescue here in Phoenix. But we do a lot of amazing work uh, to bring like the entirety of the ecosystem of animal dog rescues around Arizona together um, for premier adoption events. And um, we are a dog rescue, but we do a lot outside of that. We actually microchip every dog that comes out of the Maricopa um, County Humane Center here in Arizona, which is amazing. There's just a lot of sad statistics coming out of Arizona for 
um, just dog abandonment rates and it's just awful. So I'm doing very fulfilling work and I love it. Um, I'm also a marketing consultant on the side for a few amazing clients. Um, so I've been able to kind of, you know, find the perfect recipe, uh, for me in terms of work and balancing running and all the things, but I could not be doing the running thing if my work, um, you know, partners and bosses and ecosystems weren't as supportive as they are. So it's been amazing. Well, it does sound like fulfilling work, and and I'm so glad you're doing it. I've got to tell you, I've got a foster granddaughter, if that's the word for it, through my daughter, and that's fantastic. And, of course, the little mongrel barking at the beginning of this talk was (laughs) our rescue dog from uh, Louisiana all the way to Connecticut. So we're we're in there with you all the way. Oh, Uh, amazing. Let's talk about... New York City Marathon, if I were sitting in your shoes or someone else, I would think, damn, I want to get my PR down. I want to go to Berlin, Chicago, Valencia, Cali, mm-hmm. all those fast courses. And you pick a slow one. What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> I have just had so much fun competing and like truly focusing on just competing at races this year. And I think I, I'm not ready for Chicago where it's so focused on, you know, I mean, we have women, I, I've heard whispers of going after the American record and wanting to run close to that. And I'm not saying I couldn't do that. I just think I need a few more marathons under my belt until I, I think I could, one, survive a summer training for a race like that. Um, and two, I just, I think I'm in the mindset of, as I've said, just competing. And I think New York, I personally have run in New York quite a bit with the New York Roadrunners and they are just the most hospitable, amazing team. Um, So I just, for me, it was a great mix. And I I have family and friends in New York and just all the videos and stories I hear coming out of Marathon Day there every year. I just, my gut was just saying New York and it ultimately is the the marathon that was going to get me out of bed and excited to train at 4 45 or 5 a.m every day so I'm very excited I'm excited for the hills I've been training on the hills all year so I'm like may as well put it to good use um and I think it's yeah I think there's a lot of sneaky ones and the bridges are no joke um coming back up fifth ave or down fifth ave rather is no joke so um hoping I just stay within myself and um, set myself up well to run the last half um, faster than the first half. (laughs) Okay. So that sounds like the goal. I mean, New York is one of those places where you have to run smart because there are so many variables. There'll be a stacked Mm -hmm. field, of course, but they don't always go out hard. They can Mm -hmm. go up slow some years and and finish hard. Um, So, so other than a, a negative split, what what else would make it a good race for you? Yeah, I think, I mean, one of the main goals, I, if I were to pick one, would be going after that first American spot. Um, top American is definitely back, you know, in the back of my mind. Um, but I also don't want to count myself out in the overall race. I think, you know, there's women who are coming in fresh, um, in their build off this after not racing much, there's some coming in off of Paris. Um, this could feel really flat for them after that course, you never know. So I think it it won't be an easy feat either way, but I think, um, yeah, I just want to keep my eyes up and stay in it and be, uh, very, yeah, just not too aggressive the first half, but I want to, to not count myself out and put myself in the mix. So you had the Paris experience this summer, and you said that was an eye-opener in many ways. And of course, hey, the Olympics is only three years away, and it's practically in your backyard. Or uh, Is that something that's on your calendar for three years from now? Yeah, it definitely is. I think this year is completely like reinvigorated me. I feel like a completely different athlete than I have ever been. And I'm doing it for the right reasons, um, with the right people surrounding me. So I, I feel like why not, but I'm also not going to, it's not going to be the only thing I'm excited about these next, you know, three or four years. I think I'm going to continue to put my friends first and my family first and continue to build my career outside, you know, professionally outside of running. Um, I just think 
I'm a lot more than running now, um, which is exciting. And I want to get to the trials and the marathon having felt like I kept all of those, just kept it all in perspective. And I'm excited and having just as much fun. Um, if I'm not having fun, that's when I'll probably take a step back again or for good. Um, but I, I think I'm in a spot now where it'll be fun for a really long time. So yeah, I'm excited for 2028. I mean, LA, I'm very intrigued to see what the course will look like and how the city, um, you know, uh, hosts the Olympics. Just, I'm just very intrigued by it all and I'm excited. So it'll be fun to see how it all unfolds over the next few years. Well, yeah, the last time there was an Olympic marathon in Los Angeles, there was a uh, woman from Maine who did fairly well. And so yes, <laughs> there's some history there. Uh, Jess, you've given us so much time already. We usually ask a couple of questions at the end about the state of the sport and fairy godmother wishes. I'm not going to lay those on you unless you uh, have something you particularly would like to say. Um, I mean, I think... I, I would definitely love to add some two cents, but I think the state of the sport, especially after having stepped back, a lot has changed, I think, for the better. And I think we still have some work to do on, you know, I know the drug testing, um, anti-doping is a whole conversation in itself, but I know there's a lot of ground still to to make up for there, especially in light of, you know, the news with Shannon Roberry and what she's going through right now. And I'm happy that she's getting the recognition she deserves, but yeah, the one thing that will continue to be to worked on and improved, but I think the state of the sport is, I think there's so many great things going on. I think this year has been in, as it is around the Olympics in general, and, and oftentimes the, the storytelling for me, especially as a true marketer, I think the storytelling and the stories that we have gotten out of track and running this year has been so cool. I mean, from Shakari and, and Noah, um, Sydney, Gabby Thomas, Parker Valby. I mean, there's just so many people that come to mind that have brought more eyeballs and ears and excitement to the sport, which is very cool. Um, I hope we continue to bring and um, encourage and accept the innovative approaches to the sport that are happening with Grand Slam track and um, Athlos just, you know, having concluded, I think bringing new people, investors and money to the sport is a really good thing. Um, so I'm very excited to see how that all shakes out. Um, and then I kind of mentioned it earlier, but I think I can't remember who a guest on your show, I think it was Jenny Simpson kind of said the same thing just because I, I had a lot of joy and happiness and fulfillment in the sport when I was younger and now I'm experiencing that again, um, kind of having the mindset that I did as a high schooler. But I, I, I think one thing to kind of just keep a pulse on is how, um, yeah, how we treat and celebrate, you know, young talent and how we can set them up for longevity and um, just care for the young people in our sport. And I know there's so many people on the other side of 30 <laughs> that are <laughs> really doing that in the sport. Like I've had so many women like Sarah Hall and a few others who have always checked in on me. Um, and I, I hope to be that person for young people in the sport. So um, I think that's something that's been really great and I hope continues to, to grow. Um, but yeah, I think there's a lot of great things. There's still some work to go, um, you know, in other regards, but I'm always like the person that's going to be positive, but <laughs> That's kind of my two cents and my my rambling thoughts. Jess, thank you so much for those. I can say for sure that the sport is much better for having you be a big part of it. There are going to be a lot of people rooting for you to run well in New York City. As you know, people you don't know, as well as family members, are going to be watching you closely now and, and wishing for uh, continued success in the years to come. Thank you so much for spending the time with me today. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much. It's been awesome to be on. And um, I just love that this sport is reaching more people and has become a lifestyle for so many. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that continues. And if you're running New York and you're listening to this, have so much fun and um, hope to be on again soon. But thank you so much. And that's it for this week's episode of Running State of the Sport. 
We hope you enjoyed joining us as much as we enjoyed sharing the time with you. We'll be back again soon with another episode. Until then, please tell your friends about Running State of the Sport. We'd also appreciate a review at your favorite podcast host, like Apple Podcasts or Spotify Podcasts. In signing off, here's our hope for the state of your own personal running. Chin up, clear eyes, full heart, keep moving. Onward.